This weekend we are uh, remembering the life of one of uh, the Lord's servants, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who uh, gave his life for the pursuit of unity for the sake of the gospel. And as a church, especially a multi-ethnic church, seeking unity for the sake of the gospel, we are connected to that vision and to that mission and to that life. And we give glory to God for the works of His hand through that man that we are celebrating today. And as I was watching this video earlier, I was wondering what he would say if we had a chance to ask him, why did you do it? Why did you live a life of service? Why were you in the pursuit of unity to the point that it cost your life? And I think that he would have a greater answer than the reason that we have for much of the, many of the things that we do in life, which tends to be for fun, for pleasure, but maybe not for conviction just like he did. And, and, and see, I think that as we begin a new season in our lives, as we begin a new year, we need to pay attention to the reason that we have for this new season and for the transformation that we want to experience because at the beginning of every year, we all want to experience the transformation. We all are chasing after change. We all sign up to the gym. We all sign up for a diet. We all try and do brand new things. And then uh, just, you know, two weeks later, you, you know, you, you sin against your diet at the Waffle House. Guilty as charged. Or you let go of that transformation that you are seeking. And I believe the reason for that is that the reason we have for that is just not good enough. And I want to show you in the Bible the key to having a greater reason for everything you do. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, just the second part of that verse. The Apostle Paul says, whatever you do, everybody say whatever, do it all for the glory of God. The title of this message is A Much Better Reason. Tell the person next to you, you need a much better reason this year. Father, thank you so much for this moment where we get to celebrate you and what you do in our lives, what you do in the lives of many, and even what you have done in the life of uh, Dr. King, Lord. As, as he sought to live out the gospel in a way that was countercultural, in a way that was relentless and even unstoppable. And Father, I pray that we can all uh, glean from that what comes from your word, Jesus, that you don't do anything halfway, and you're not asking us to do anything halfway, but to follow you wholeheartedly and to get an even greater reason, Lord. I pray that you speak into our lives and that we focus on your message and not on this messenger. Because you are everything, Lord. And I pray these things in your holy and powerful name, Jesus, Son of God. Amen. I made the mistake of asking my wife to climb a Pinnacle Mountain with me during the month of July. It was a rookie mistake. I'm not from Arkansas. I didn't know that when you climb Pinnacle in the middle of July, it accelerates your weight loss because of the heat. The mistake got even greater because I had promised her an afternoon, just the two of us, on a date. And instead of taking her to a restaurant or a steak, instead of taking her to a park, I decided to go up Pinnacle Mountain. When she asked me, why are we going up the mountain, I said, just for fun. It was not a good enough reason. About halfway, she started giving me that face that uh, wives give. Raise your hand if you're a husband. If you're a husband, you know what this face is that, that wives give. Well, really, my wife doesn't give me that face. Maybe your wife does. She gave me a glance of what she was thinking. And when we got to the top, after struggling with the heat, she told me words that I will never forget, words that have marked me from that point on forward. She said, if this had been a first date, there would not have been a second one. <laughs> you see, just for fun wasn't a good enough reason for us to climb that mountain. 
And, and, and all of us are facing a mountain, especially at the beginning of a season, at the beginning of a new year, at the beginning of a, a, of a new uh, moment in our lives. We tend to face these mountains, and maybe they are mountains that we have to climb relationally. Maybe they are spiritual mountains. Maybe they're emotional mountains. Maybe they are physical mountains. And by that, what I mean is maybe we have tasks ahead of us that seem like an upward climb, but if you don't have a good enough reason, you will not make it to the top. And sometimes when we come up with all these New Year resolutions, we decide that we're going to do all these things, and we do it for, uh, for uh, entertainment reasons. We do it for cosmetic reasons. Sometimes we may even do it because of an ideology. But if the reason is not good enough, you're not going to make it all the way to the top. See, I think, I think uh, Dr. King had a mountain in front of him that he would not have been able to climb all the way to the top and to, uh, and to give life to a movement that needed a boost and to do it from the background and the foundation and the goal of the gospel in unity for all people if he hadn't had a good reason. He would have not been able to do what he did if the reason he did it was just for fun. Using the book of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul is answering a few questions to a church that was divided. This was a church that was, uh, that was tired of division. It was a church that was suffering from sin. It was a church that was even criticizing their leaders. And so in, in, a, in an answer or response to that, Paul writes this letter to the, uh, to the first Christian church in Corinth, and they receive this letter, which we now have as 1 Corinthians. And there's a question that they bring to him, which is, we have these believers in our church that are not eating uh, food that is holy. Because they, they are buying food from the supermarket, and, and, and the distributor of the supermarket is buying that food from temples where they make sacrifices to other gods. And because of that chain of distribution, we deem all this uh, food that they're getting as unholy. And so, Pastor Paul, what do you say about that? And so in the middle of that division, uh, Paul responds with this uh, statement, which is, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. See, he's giving them a freedom, but he's also giving them a purpose. He is saying, in matters of this petty discussion, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And I think that reason applies not just to the things that we eat, but also to how we live our lives. And I believe that we can apply this practically as we begin a new season in our lives, and even a new season as a church. And I'm going to use the same words from that verse to apply this practically to our lives. The first thing that I want us to understand is that whatever we do with our time, we have to do it for the glory of God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, it says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. See, the, the, the Apostle Paul now saying to another church, he is saying you have to make use of the time in a wise way by knowing the will of God in your life. In other words, whatever amount of time that you have, you have to use it for a purpose, and that purpose has to be to fulfill the will that God has for you. One of my favorite movies is the movie Interstellar, because I'm a geek like that. How many of you have watched Interstellar? My fellow geeks, thank you. The rest of you have to go and watch it and then come ask me questions, because it's awesome. There's a line in that movie that one of the characters uh, pronounces because of their exposure to relativity, and I'm not going to get into that, but as they're trying to figure out their resources in space, one of the characters says, we have to think of time as a resource just like oxygen. See, we tend to think of time as something that never ends. We tend to think that the time that we have is going to be endless and that we are going to have it forever and that there is still time for us to do the things that we know that God is calling uh, us for, that he has created us for, because we don't see an end to that. However, the Bible is telling us time for us is also a finite resource. It can only last for a time. In fact, uh, in another portion, the scriptures say that our life uh, is like mist. 
that it begins and it ends quickly. And so we don't have a, a, a lot of time for us to do the things that God has called us to do. What do you think God is calling you to do with your life? What are some of the decisions that you've been struggling to make because they are going to cost you something? What are, the, what are the steps that you need to take because, because of a sacrifice in your life? You've not been able to do so, but you know it's God's will for your life. See, we tend to waste our time in things like gossip. And we love to talk about other people and how bad they are in comparison with us. Because we are the standard. <laughs> or at the very least, I know that I am the standard by which all y'all are measured. But God doesn't say that, that, that we should do that. In fact, uh, He says in His Word that they, even our words should be holy. What are we wasting our time on? Are we wasting our time on, on, on negative things that are um, invading our minds? Perhaps we're wasting our time having, uh, having a faith in negative things rather than having faith in the things that the Lord does and in His life, sacrifice, resurrection. We spend too much time allowing fear to enter our lives or maybe even allowing opinion that dishonors God because we know it all. Perhaps we're wasting time on Facebook. Facebook is not a bad thing, but if you're on Facebook, you, you, you're a peeping Tom. The average American uh, wastes 40 minutes of their day on Facebook, just looking at what other people are doing. And sometimes we start looking at what, what God is doing through other people, and we start feeling jealous for what God is doing through other people. And, and what he's saying is, you have the same resource that I've given that person, which is time, and you can use that time to give glory to Jesus. I'm not saying don't get on Facebook, but we can control that. Because the use of our time is in our hands. And we can use it for God's glory. See, I, I believe that God created us for something more. That God created us uh, for a purpose. That his purpose in our lives is not for us to be uh, couch potatoes, but, but you know, to be a potato casserole for people to see the goodness and the deliciousness that is the word of God. And he has called you for something specific, and there's only so much time for you to do it. I believe Dr. King responded to this in a timely manner. Did you know that at 35, he had already won a Nobel Peace Prize? Y'all, I'm 36 right now. I feel like such a chump. When I found out that, I just kind of felt like I need to make better use of my time. Of course, we don't want to fall into comparisons. I say that as a joke. But what we do need to understand is that we can see in the example, not just of Dr. King, but of so many other heroes of the faith, how we can make better use of our time. And the use that we give our time aligns us with the calling of God in a way that helps us understand what we are to do and how we are to do it. In 1967, Dr. King um, gave a speech at a high school in Philadelphia called What is Your Life's Blueprint? And I want to read you a portion from that speech where he talks about uh, understanding what you are to do for God and how you should do it. He says, when you discover what you will be in life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can be a pine up the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. But be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. He finishes by saying this, be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by, the, by size that you win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. 
this is a man who is responding to the calling of Jesus, who is serving Jesus with everything he has and understands the calling in his life to a point that he is giving his life to it. Are you ready to say the same for the calling in your life? And if so, can you make use of the resource that you have in front of you so that you can use it for God's glory? This resource of time is not the only thing that you have because you also have talents that you can use for him. That's the second thing that we can understand as a practical way of applying this scripture into our lives, that whatever you do with your talents, you have to do for the glory of God. In Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. See, all of us have been given gifts, talents, abilities. And whether you believe that you are born with it or that you uh, make your talents as you, as you go and grow, the Lord has given these things to you and you are to use those talents for his glory. The Apostle Paul is saying if you, are, if, if you have the gift of leadership, then you should lead. If you have the gift of teaching, that you should teach. This is a verse that really affected me uh, a few years ago because as I was, uh, before uh, coming to Mosaic, as I was seeking out what to do with my life, I knew that he was calling me to be a teacher and to be a teacher for more than just one people group. This is why I preach here in English and I also preach in the Spanish venue where Pastor Alberto uh, allows me the pulpit every once in a while to preach in Spanish. And most people when they meet me, they think, oh, you must be the Hispanic pastor. What they mean is you must be pastoring the Hispanics. My answer is, yes, I am Hispanic and I am a pastor, but I want to pastor and, and, and disciple not just Hispanics, but every, people from every nation that I can because I feel that I have this calling in my life. Now, I am not claiming quality. You are all witnesses of this today. I'm only claiming calling and gift. And I want to use that for the glory of God. See, there are some gifts that you have that I don't have that I don't even want to mess with. For example, um, um, I hate numbers. Numbers scare me. My parents, when I was little, instead of telling me horror stories about a monster under my bed, they would tell me, if you don't go to sleep tomorrow, you have to do our taxes because I just, I hate numbers. And some of you have that gift. I have a, a friend uh, who has that gift, and so she wanted to serve in the church, and she said, Alex, I'm not a public speaker. I am not a, uh, I'm not a musician. Uh, the, uh, there's nothing that I can do even. Th don't even put me to greet people because I'm an introvert, but you know what I can do is I can count. And so if you need help with the accounting of the church, then sign me up. And I said, hallelujah, glory to God, because that's not a gift I have. One of our staff here at the church, his name is Wendell, he was building um, a room in the warehouse over here, and he and I were having a conversation this week about his gifting because I don't possess that gift. I am, I am not handy, contrary to what some of you may think because of the way I look. I... I have the gift of jab, not the gift of build. And so I, I, I was sharing that with my brother, and he was saying, well, you can do this if I teach you. And I, and I was telling him, brother, I, I've tried learning to do things with my hands, and I always mess it up. I bring dishonor to my family when I do that. <laughs> well, the reason I was building some rooms is because we have things that we have to keep over there so that we can make sure that these environments in which you're in are primed to point people to Jesus. In other words, so that when new people come into this building, they're not worrying about the color of the paint on the walls. They're not worrying about the boxes that you have to jump over to get to the auditorium. They're not worrying about anything having to do with this building, but only focusing on, on hearing from the Lord and connecting with people who represent Jesus in their lives. And so what my brother Wendell does in the back, even though he is not on this stage is directly related to our ability to reach people with the resources that we've been given. And it's through a gift that I don't have. Are you running away from your gift? 
Maybe, maybe you have a perception of, of, of what being a gifted person is. I want to let you know you are a gifted person. You may need to find your gift. See, this happens a lot with singers. Uh, there's many people that raise their hands and they say, I want to be in the worship team. And then when we audition them for the worship team, we just, we begin to exercise, you know, we begin to just pray over them. And, and we're like, whatever's in there has to come out because it's just <laughs> not holy. And you may think that you, ha that you have that gift because you hear yourself in the shower and you go, uh, wow, somebody else needs to hear that other than my husband and my kids, but maybe the answer is no, don't give us that gift. <laughs> maybe the gift that you have is the gift of, gift of hospitality like the, like the Bryans, Huber and Triopia in this church. That every single time that we have an event, they cater it with quality. They involve people. They're here for some events at four or five in the morning because that is their gift. I don't, you don't want me cooking. Not even Mexican food. Well, first of all, I'm not Mexican, but you don't want me <laughs> cooking anything. <laughs> you have a gift that you need to pursue. Don't pursue what you perceive should be your gift. Pursue the gift that the Lord has given you. So that whatever you do with your talents, you use it for the glory of God. By the way, Pastor Mike uh, Clowers, if you would uh, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, this handsome man here is hosting an experience on Sunday the second, uh, so, is it Sunday the fifth? Um, at nine in the morning called Finding Your Fit. Everybody say, Find Your Fit. You've been properly invited. If you want to figure out what your spiritual gift is, if you want to figure out how to align with God's purposes in your life, then you want to join this class and allow Pastor Mike to guide you through that and disciple you through that because he will make sure that you are plugged in according to your gifts. Amen? Because whatever you do with your talents, you have to do for the glory of God. In fact, the more you use your talents, I believe the closer you will get to your purpose. And the closer you are to your purpose, the more blessing you see because the Lord will want to fulfill his purposes in your life. It says in the New Testament that every good work that he has begun, he will what? He will bring to completion. And so if you are his handiwork, don't you think that he would want to complete that work of art? Whatever you do with your talents, do it for the glory of God. Not just with your time and your talents, but also with your treasure. That whatever you do with the financial resources that you have been given, you have to do it for the glory of God. If you want to walk away, because I'm going to start to talk about money, you're not welcome to do so. <laughs> See, I, I believe that God has also called us to be generous. In a, a 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, uh, Paul is telling once again uh, First Christian Church at Corinth, He's saying, since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. He is saying to the first Christian church in Corinth, I want you to be known, no, not just for your teaching, I want you to be known not just for your works, but I want you to be known for your generosity. Mosaic Church, uh, can, can maybe we be known as a church not just for our passion for Jesus, not just for the fact that we're a multi-ethnic church where we want to reflect heaven on earth, but also for our relentless and unstoppable generosity. See, we don't understand this, you guys, unless we we reach a moment of need. In the year 2002 or 2003, there was a political strike in my home country where I was living at the time. I was a law student. I would work with my father. Sometimes I would teach English. Sometimes I would teach music. And that's how I tried to make a living, but didn't really at the time need anything but a part-time job because of the generosity of my parents. And then the opposition decided to shut down every industry in the nation. And so there was no work for four or five months. There was no school. There was, there was no activity that would create financial gain for people. And so that's when a lot of Venezuelans started to uh, leave the country. My mother and my, and my brother included, they had to leave because my father, for the first time in our lives, couldn't make ends meet. 
I had never seen an empty refrigerator until that moment in my life. And now that I'm a parent, I wonder the stress and the pain that my father was going through at the time and the fact that he couldn't really provide because of a political situation in the nation. So in the, we did have a few days where we had to skip a meal or two. I'm not saying this so that you would have pity on me. I'm saying it to boast about the church because the church of Jesus Christ got activated almost like a superhero. And people started to share everything they had, just like it says in the book of Acts. They would share meals. They would share uh, even gallons of gasoline because it would take you eight, nine, ten hours at the gas station to get your gas, and it was dangerous. And, and, and sometimes you would, you would lose your spot in the line of cars because of people's fighting and, and struggling. And at that time, the church began to provide for one another. And I understood at that moment or began to understand the value of generosity. I'm talking not just about your tithe. I'm talking about the way that you live with your finances. Because I believe Jesus wants us to focus more on our generosity and the level of our giving than the level of our income. Matthew chapter 6, verses 30 and 31, Jesus says, If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen. Don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you. Do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. What Jesus is saying is, I don't want you concerned about the getting. I want you more concerned about the giving. Church, could it be that if we were more concerned about our ability to give and be generous with those around us, that the Lord would increase blessing in our lives in our, one way or another so that others would be blessed? And see, we begin the year going, I want to raise my salary this year, and I'm going to hustle, and I'm going to do it by uh, making a, a homemade soap, or I'm going to do it by getting another job, or I'm going to do it by whatever means possible. And the least, we, the, the, the least reason for that is generosity. It may be that this year the Lord is going to give you the opportunity to bless somebody in your life beyond your ability so that you can experience sacrificious giving and also increased blessing in return. I'm not saying God is going to pay you back. Like there was a man in a church that I used to work at where he called one day and he said, I heard the pastor talk about giving and it's been three weeks and I still haven't gotten my money from God. Where is it? That's the day that I got put out of that phone line and they said, Alex, please don't provide any more pastoral work over the phone. We don't want you helping anybody like that. Because I was so aggravated when he said that. The Bible does say that there will be blessing when we give and it might be financial, but some of us are not, uh, are not either generous enough or, or good with our money enough for us to receive even more financial gains. So we have to grow in that. Maybe the blessing that you will receive is spiritual. Maybe the blessing that you will receive is contentment in what, in what you have and even what you've sacrificially lost and given for the betterment of somebody else. Or maybe the blessing is something that I can't even fathom right now that you will receive. When you give and give sacrificially, the Bible says you do receive blessing. You will be surprised by the way in which he blesses you through your generosity. Some of you are saying, well, I don't have enough money to give. My, my salary is just so low and my bills are killing me, so I don't have enough to give. And I've had people say, the day that I start making over six figures, that's the day that I will tithe because I will have enough. In other words, for those of you who don't know what a tithe is, is giving to the church 10% um, as an obedience to God of your income. And we don't force you to do this. You don't have to do this. Jesus says in the New Testament that, he, that, that we need to be cheerful givers. So whatever we give, we give to the glory of God and we give in cheerfulness. But maybe you're thinking, I just don't have enough to give. I'm, I'm a little short. Rockefeller, one of the richest men, uh, richest people in the world said, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars if I, that I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 per week. In other words, church, if, if we don't start being generous at this level of our resources, we will not be generous at a greater level of blessing. 
and we need to be good stewards of our blessing and be generous with others. There may be an organization in town that needs your generosity. Maybe there is a, a community of believers that needs your generosity. Maybe there is a, a, a relative or somebody in this community that needs your generosity and it may hurt, but it comes with a blessing because we give for the glory of God. We give so that the Lord can be glorified. I don't want you to see what you have in your hands as little resources. There's a story in the Old Testament and it's the story of Samson. And if you don't know Samson, he's the man who the Lord made the strongest man on earth. And Samson, uh, with his strength, uh, even though he sinned, he defeated the, the Philistines in an amazing way. And you need to go to the book of Judges and read it. I'm not going to read you the whole story. But there was an occasion when uh, Samson was called to fight against a thousand Philistines. And all he had in front of him was uh, the jawbone of a donkey. And it says in the word that the Holy Spirit took over Samson and with this piece of bone, with this piece of carcass, he defeated a thousand men. I need you to understand that what you have in your life, the Lord can use today. That you don't need to wait until you have more to ask God to use those resources for his glory. That he can use anything you have to do anything he wants. And that through His Holy Spirit, He can take everything that is in your hands right now and use it for His glory. See, whatever we do with our time has to be for the glory of God. Whatever we, we do with our, uh, with our talents has to be for the glory of God. Whatever we do with our treasure has to be for the glory of, of God. And lastly, whatever we do with our testimony has to be for the glory of God. Revelation chapter 12 verses 10 and 11 says, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by what? By the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. See, this is the Lord reminding us that Jesus wins in the end that the devil loses and that the strategy for the devil to lose is for the sacrifice of Jesus to make such a work in your life that your testimony becomes attractive to those who need hope but are hopeless who need an answer who need forgiveness and eternity because the plan of the devil is for people not to find out about Jesus this is why he wants to shut down the use of your gifts, of your time, of your treasure, and of your testimony. By the way, your testimony is the way, the, the words that you use to represent and distribute the work of God in your life. What are the words of your testimony these days? Is your testimony filled more with things that disappoint you? Is your testimony filled more with the things that hurt you or offend you? Is your testimony these days filled more with what should be in the lives of others? You see, I need you to know that you have to change your testimony from the things that depress, depress you and disappoint you to the things that delight you. Because the Bible says that the things that we delight on, if they are of the Lord, in other words, if we delight ourselves in Jesus, that he fulfills the desires of our hearts for his glory. That our testimony has to reflect the glory of God. If you don't have a testimony, I'm not telling you that, that, that you should have an overnight experience with the Lord, although some of you do have it and you can share it. But if you have not seen God at work in your life, you need to start asking today. And instead of asking in 2017, Lord, can you give me a greater salary? Although he might give you a greater salary, who knows? Start asking, can you move in my life? Can you work in the things that I, I am putting before you? Can you fix the things that are broken? Can you, can you uh, beautify the things that are ugly? Uh, can you bring redemption in areas of my life where redemption is needed? Because I want to see you at work, Jesus. You're alive, and I want to bear good witness for your name. Because it's all for the glory of God. I will finish with this. 
Back in November, I had the experience of uh, giving uh, Dr. Perkins a ride from his hotel to the conference that um, Mosaic's Global Network, which is led by founding Pastor Mark. We had this conference in Dallas, and I had the opportunity to pick him up and take him to the conference. And he was kind and generous enough to have a conversation with me. And I'm noticing this man who is now in his 80s, and I think if somebody's in their 80s, they should be slowing down. And if they're not slowing down, their body will start asking them that. And so I asked him, Dr. Perkins, why are you doing these things? Why are you still traveling so much and speaking so much about unity and about racial reconciliation? And he said, because it's my lot in life. You have your lot, I have my lot, she has her lot. In other words, I have a calling and I must fulfill it for the glory of God. And church, I want you to begin this year, 2017, with a much better reason to live out a new season. And that that reason may be that it's all done for the glory of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this time and for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you that we can give you glory with everything that you give us, everything that we are and have. Father, may we not leave here unchanged. May we understand that everything that you've given us, everything that we are and have, can be leveraged for your name and your purposes, Lord. I pray that this can be a year of discovery for those who still need to understand their spiritual gifting and calling, and that this can be a year of affirmation for those who are in that path, but, you can, but that you can give a brand new revelation to every single one of us as we serve you and give you glory, Lord, even when it hurts, even when it's uncomfortable, uh, even when it's painful, or even when we are attacked for doing so, so that your name, Jesus, can be glorified in our lives. And I pray these things, your holy and powerful name, Jesus, Son of God, resurrected. Amen.